So given the scope and the magnitude of this new reality that we're facing, I think it's important for us to understand that there is no easy solution or fix to this problem. However, that doesn't mean that we're without hope. There are actually some practical things that we could start doing um, in our ministries that are going to start pushing that needle in the other direction. You see, as churches and parachurch ministries, there are things we can do that are going to help us create the kinds of environments where students, specifically those dealing with mental health disorders, can both belong, thrive, and find health, wholeness, and healing. In this session, we're going to talk about five systemic changes that we can make in our ministry that are going to help us counter some of the devastating effects of systemic abandonment, which, as we saw, is a part of what's fueling this whole crisis. And to do that, we're going to look at the five contributing factors that we presented in session three, and then we're going to talk about some of the changes that we can make to respond to them. So let's start with the first problem we've got to address. It's the breakdown of the traditional family. All right, the data shows this traditional family, right, mom, dad, it is becoming less and less prevalent as time goes on. And you know that if you work with students. Each year, more of your kids are growing up in single-parent homes or non-traditional homes. Now, I fully understand there's very little that we could do to change the tide of culture as a youth pastor or as a youth worker. I get that. But there are still some things we can do to help. You see, we can focus on making sure that what we're doing um, is actually supporting and caring for the families, regardless of what they look like, of these students that we serve. And so the change that we make is actually to create a strong family ministry system. We need to see parents and grandparents, foster parents, aunts, uncles, whoever's raising our students, we need to see them as our allies, as our partners, and we need to do whatever we can to actually support them, to encourage them, to train them, and to empower them. You see, our job as youth workers is not just to care for students, it's to care for the whole family system, because when the family is healthy, odds are the student is healthy as well. I've got some practical ways you can start doing this written down in your handbook. We could start by developing a partnership mentality when it comes to working with families. We can see families as being just important as students, and we change our philosophy and our programming accordingly. We can create pathways for parents to be trained and developed. You can utilize parenting seminars. You can educate and empower parents on relevant issues, talk about things like social media, discipling their kids. You could even do a seminar on mental health, and you could provide practical resources that will help them apply that knowledge in their parenting skills. You could host regular parent gatherings where relationships can be built between ministry leaders and parents, as well as between parents and parents. You see, the more that you can do to bring parents out of isolation and into community with one another, the more success you're going to have at creating a relationship uh, that has tons of networks that are in place to help care for an adolescent when they're struggling with mental health disorders. Well, the next problem we've got to address is this. It's the loss of social capital. Right, the data's in. The meaningful relationships that adolescents used to have with non-parental adults are becoming less and less frequent. And this has had disastrous consequences for the social and emotional development of adolescents, often leaving them alone to figure out how to grow up in a world when they're not ready to. Typically, that doesn't end well. And so the change that we can make here is to create an intentional strategy for building relationships across the generations in our ministry context. Right? We need to be proactive in trying to bring the younger and the older generations together. We need to stop doing the things that segregate us and instead start doing the things that can unite us. Some practical ways you can start to implement this change. You can create pathways for students to begin serving alongside of adults in different areas of the church or in parachurch ministries that you're a part of. You can recruit and enlist a wide range of adults who can serve in the ministry. You see, typically we've got this idea of like, I need 10 students for every one leader that I have. But what if there's a new way of thinking about that? The Fuller Youth Institute has recommended that you shift your thinking into actually thinking about five students for every, five adults for every one student. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got like five adults showing up for every one kid at your program. That's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is having five adults who are committed to strategically investing in the life of every adolescent who is a part of your ministry. That's a really good number. The more adults that you can get, the better the relationships are going to be. Another thing that you can do is you can create service-oriented activities and initiatives that have the singular goal of connecting the generations on a regular basis in the work of serving others. And for Gen Z, this generation who's growing up right now, that's really important. They love to do stuff with people. They love to be involved in serving. And so if you can give them an opportunity to do that alongside of adults, that's going to help 
break down that loss of social capital and create meaningful relationships. Well, the third problem we've got to address is this. It's the rise of social media. You see, these students who are part of our ministry, they're digital natives. They're practically glued to their phones, which makes sense. I mean, unlike most of us, they've always lived in a world where this stuff has existed. We grew up in a world where relationships happen together face to face, but they grew up in a world where most of their relationships happen in the digital world. And so our solution, it can't be to remove them from these social media platforms or to preach about the evils of social media because that's just going to make us irrelevant and it's going to destroy, destroy any chance that we have to actually make any kind of a meaningful change. Instead, we've got to operate with the assumption that there are actually opportunities where we can step into that space with a plan and counter the negative effects that social media is having on them. So in light of this, the change we make is to create a strategy for online ministry that actually engages students. Here's some practical ways to do this. You could develop an online strategy that moves away from focusing on just communicating information and instead to have a strategy that is trying to uh, build relationships. In light of that, you can embrace the world of social ministry not as being an add-on to what you're doing in addition to your in-person gatherings, but rather you begin to see this social world as the front door to your ministry. You use it to tell stories. You use it to highlight students and to speak about the things that are actually on the hearts of the students who are around you. You can also engage with students in these different platforms in personal ways because in meeting students on their turf, you're showing them that you care and in doing that, you are building the needed social capital to be a trusted adult that they have in their life when they're actually struggling. When you're on social media as well, you have the ability to counter some of the negative images that they hear and to replace it with the gospel truth of who they truly are. Well, that brings us up to our fourth problem, and that's the busyness and the stress that students face on a daily basis. As we saw in the earlier session, the stress is placed on them to succeed and to perform, whether from internal or external voices. It has had disastrous effects on their mental health and well-being. And I'm sure you know students who have dealt with this. Maybe you even know students who are dealing with this right now. It is absolutely brutal but there are some things that we can do to help. The change we can make is to create a strategy for building margin and rest into the things that we do as a ministry. You see, these students that we serve, they're overwhelmed at school, they are. Many of them are overwhelmed at home, they are. But they don't have to be overwhelmed at church. We can create spaces for them to come and to just be. Here's some ideas for how you can do this. You can focus on creating space for students to slow down and experience rest, solitude, and Sabbath in the programs that you offer them. Give them the ability to learn about the spiritual disciplines and to begin practicing together. Because if you do this, you're actually equipping them with the tools that they need to combat that pressure and stress in their life when it happens. When students are dealing with stressful times, whether it's finals week or college application week, you can create opportunities for them to come together, to prepare together, to be together. You see, whenever a student feels seen, heard, or cared for, it removes that feeling of isolation that they have, and it serves to alleviate a lot of the stress and the pressure that they're experiencing. Once a year, take students on a spiritual retreat. Unlike a camp experience where the goal is to get hyped, this is an opportunity to slow down and to pay attention to the things that are happening in a student's soul. You give them the opportunity to engage with spiritual disciplines and to just sit in silence and listen. Now, I've got one more idea. It might not feel like it's the role of a youth worker, but I think it's actually pretty relevant and important. You see, a great way where we could do this for students is we could actually become vocal advocates for them, right? We can build relationships with teachers, administrators, and coaches and help educate them on the realities of what's happening to adolescents. Take some of the data that's in this seminar and go present it to them. When there are school board meetings, show up and when appropriate, make the case for your students, You're not always going to get your way, but I promise you, the students are going to see what you're doing. The community is going to notice. The parents are going to notice. And it's going to build more trust, and it's going to give you more insight, and it might even give you the ability to affect change on a much larger scale than just your ministry. Well, that brings us up to the last problem that we've got to address, and that is the loss of religiosity. In both of those studies that we looked at, we can see that there is a long and gradual move that students are having away from organized religion. Now, there are a lot of reasons as to why this could be happening. 
But perhaps the most shocking reason is the reality that a lot of students, if they're honest, they just don't see the appeal. They're bored. They come to believe that Christianity actually has nothing of value or substance to offer to them. And that's on us. But luckily, we can do something about it. The change that we can make is to create a strategy for discipleship that offers students the opportunities to experience the fullness of the life that Jesus offers to them. See, if they think Christianity is relevant or boring, we've got to do the hard work of showing them that it's not. We've got to show them just how misinformed they are. We need to help them see the beauty of this life that God is actually inviting them into. And there's some practical ways you can do this. Uh, The first is this, develop a long-range teaching plan that actually covers the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith and answers some of the core questions that our students are asking. This is really important, right? Kind of seems like a no-brainer, but the reality is most youth workers, we just kind of go topic to topic, what's going to work? We've got to be strategic. We need to teach the whole scope of theology and doctrine because in doing that, we actually give them the information they need to make an honest assessment of this faith that we're talking about. Another thing we could do is start to move away from lecture-based teaching and instead engage conversations in students, asking them what they think, asking them why they think it. You see, students don't always want to be talked at. Sometimes they want to be talked to. That's a big part of their learning process. And by doing this, again, we earn social capital by showing them that we are trusted adults who actually care about them. Another thing we could do is seek to offer practical application to the things that we're teaching. And we need to create pathways and opportunities for students, regardless of their faith journey, to actually start practicing them. You see, what we communicate, it shouldn't be stale. It should be life-giving and applicable. And lastly, we need to create space for students to ask questions and to challenge ideas. Questions aren't bad. They're a sign that someone is wrestling with something. As the Fuller Youth Institute has said, it's the unasked questions that are the most dangerous. So these are the five systemic changes that we can make. Now, before we move on, I know that there are probably some of you who are maybe feeling a little bit duped right now, right? Maybe you thought this is going to be a seminar that was a little more practical, give you some tools or curriculum or whatever that's going to help you help these kids who are hurting. Maybe you're thinking, I haven't actually told you anything you don't know. That I actually haven't given you anything that's going to help you serve and care for a kid who's dealing with anxiety and depression. Well, if that's what you're thinking, I, I fully understand it. I might be thinking the same thing too, but... Um, I actually think I have given you some pretty good tools. And I want you to hear me out. I'm going to pull in some research to make my case because I think the data indicates that what we just talked about is actually incredibly significant. You see, in 2017, the Attorney General of Colorado commissioned a study that was led by the Health Management Associates. And this is a, a group of researchers, ridiculously high standards. And their job was to look at what was happening in the state as it relates to anxiety, depression, and suicide. You see, the officials had noticed that there had been a rapid rise in suicides and anxiety, depression. They wanted to figure out, okay, what's happening? Why is it happening? And what can we do about it? Well, after conducting research and interviews over the course of the next year, the HMA came back with a list of eight recommendations for the state to begin working on that they said would begin to reverse the trend. These are the top four. Number one, focus on prioritizing relationships between youth and adults. Number two, Create a culture of support for youth in crisis as well as post-crisis. Number three, implement programs or strategies that build resilience and coping skills. And number four, increase access to pro-social activities and supportive environments. When we're strategic about the five changes that we talked about in this session, all four of these are going to happen. And I got to be honest, I don't think anybody can do all of these things better than the church can. Like we have all the tools, we have all the systems, we just need to be strategic. See, the reality is, is there's never going to be a foolproof system for caring for adolescents who are dealing with a mental health crisis like anxiety or depression. There just won't be. Because every student that we serve is different. They all have different stories. But if we can create strategies that help us towards work, working at strengthening these relationships at home, if we can get loving adults into the lives of students, if we can meet them on their own turf, advocating for students, creating margin for rest and for reflection, if we could help them experience the wonder and the beauty of this Christian life, 
We are creating environments and relationships where students can belong, feel safe, and grow. And I promise you, every kid who is dealing with anxiety or depression would benefit and be better off because of that. And the beauty is, is it's not just going to be these kids who are a part of our ministry. They're going to tell their friends, their parents are going to tell their, their friends. And we're going to get all kinds of kids who are hurting coming because this is the place where they know we actually care. Now, before you move on to session six, there are a couple questions here for you guys to reflect on based on this content. I'd love you to talk through it. And once you do that, you can meet us in the next session.